can we stand together? Can we stand together? We just really want to celebrate uh, a couple of things. First of all, good morning. Welcome, everybody. Isn't it good to be in God's house? Come on, let's put our hands together again. Man. We want to celebrate this last Wednesday where we had our prayer and praise service. We had more people out for prayer and praise. Just God people coming together to cry out to God. And I tell you, chains were broken. God spoke to us. A number of people got saved. I mean, some folks literally came to the altar. I prayed with them myself. So God is was really moving. So thank God for you. Thank God for you. Thank God for you. And if you weren't able to be here for whatever reason, your kids, your job, whatever reason, don't worry about it. You have been covered in prayer. Amen. You covered. Amen. You covered. We also want to celebrate uh, the premiere of Myron Davis's movie, Maestro's movie, One Last Prayer. And Friday night, it was fantastic. We love you. So gifted. And so many other members of our church and people included. There's so many gifts in this city. It's amazing. We need to really encourage our artists. Take your Bibles and turn to Malachi chapter 3 for the reading of God's word. It is Faith Tide Sunday, so you know we got to go into Malachi got to go there, amen, once or twice, and you got to get some time in Malachi. Malachi chapter 3, let's read verses 7 through 10 aloud together. Yet from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, but you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you that you are so merciful and kind to us. We thank you that you're so generous. We thank you that you take care of us. And God, we pray you would just speak to us in this moment as we're looking at how to be biblical givers, how to give according to your plan, not a financial planner's plan, not, not man's plan, but your plan. Not only how to give, but how to handle the other 90%, dear God, that brings you glory and honor. Father, we just sang a song, said that we're standing here only because of your grace, only because you made a way. And Father, that's so indicative of our story, and we're grateful. So God, continue to stir up in us, dear God, a spirit of generosity so that our hearts can be just like your heart. And God, we're praying for the man, the woman, the family that's here under this prayer, here in this time, dear God, who's troubled with finances. It's heavy on them, dear God. We pray you would lift that heavy burden. We pray you would make provision. And even in this time together, we pray, dear God, you would move miraculously to speak to their hearts on how to receive breakthrough. We pray you would do miracles, dear God, to, to, to work their situation out. Now, God, we pray you would bless this time and be glorified, and it will be careful to give you praise, glory, and honor. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray and for his glory. We say this together. Amen. 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 So today is Faith Tithe Sunday, and we're excited about that. We are bringing a tithe today into God's house so that we can keep growing. Uh, we need to grow in this area of giving so that we as God's people can take the challenge to be biblical givers. Our goal, as we've been putting before you, is to raise $130,000. But the more important goal is to raise up faithful followers of Jesus Christ, obedient followers of Jesus Christ, for it's impossible to enjoy God and obey God without learning to enjoy giving. I want to thank God for each of you and just your commitment to unite with us on this very special day that we do a couple of times a year where we as a church family, we as members of this church, we are on the same page on one accord. We unite our hearts to bring a tithe. But more importantly, I want to thank you for your willingness to grow and for your willingness to keep growing in obedience and your love for God. This is one of the hardest areas for us to obey God on, and yet it's so important to the heart of God. We just heard an incredible testimony by Ishmael, one of our members, a young man who, for all practical purposes, could have found so many reasons not to be a biblical giver, not to be a sacrificial giver, not to be a tither, but just the opposite. He found every reason to obey God in this, and God continues to bless him in each and every way, and I pray that same for each of you as well. God wants us to have a joy in our relationship with him, and it's impossible to have that joy if we do not enjoy giving. 
because God enjoys giving. So if you want to experience the joy of the Lord in a greater way, there needs to be a freeing from money and an obedience to use money according to God's plans. And God says, bring a tenth into my house and then carefully use that other 90 percent to save, to spend, to take care of life. I give you prescriptions on how to handle the other 90 percent and not just the 10 percent as well. He says, even use that for my glory. And here's my premise to you. You will find greater joy when you give according to God's plan. You will find greater joy when you give according to God's plan. There was a man who knew that his six-year-old son loved French fries, specifically French fries from McDonald's, and it had been a while, so it was a Saturday morning, just out of the blue, he just surprised his son. He said, hey, son, come on, get in the truck. I'm going to drive you up to McDonald's. I'm going to get you some French fries. The, 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 the kid went ballistic. He was so excited. So he gets in the truck, and he drives him up. They go through the drive through window, and they give him the, the bag of French fries. He, he gives them to his son. His son's eyes are just as wide as all get out, and he's over there looking at his French fries, beginning to enjoy them. And before the father pulls off, he said, hey, son, can I have one? Just one. And it, it was almost like in slow motion, like a movie, because as the father's hand moved to grab one, the son's fingers slowly made a fence <laughs> over, <laughs> over the French fries. And he only stared in front of him. He had an angry look on his face. He started ignoring his dad. And his dad was shocked. He could not believe it. He was stunned. I mean, here he was, having given his son a gift and wanting to enjoy it with him. Instead, he found someone who did not enjoy giving. I want to submit to you that God takes us to McDonald's all the time. Amen? Amen. And yet he tells us to give a small portion back to him for his glory, for his kingdom. And when God asks us to give, it's not because he's desperately in need of our own money. He can afford his own french fries, amen? amen? But he's asking because it's another way for him to enjoy his relationship with us. Yes. Because giving is such an important part of who God is. And if you want to know what brings God real joy, giving is at the top of his list. So if you want to delight with the Lord, if you want to play in the sandbox that God enjoys playing in, you have to have this whole issue of giving as part of who you are. Another reason that God wants us to experience greater joy through giving is that by giving, God gives us joy. And joy serves as a layer, a protective layer over our heart concerning those darker things that money and materialism can stir up in us. Things like covetousness. Giving is kind of um, a, a, a serum that helps us on a regular basis to keep our hearts clean from greed and covetousness and jealousy and all those type of things and discontentment and when we don't learn to enjoy giving, we'll find ourselves through our life saying, you know, why am I always so jealous? Why am I always so coveting? Why am I always so discontent? Why can't I ever be satisfied? Why am I always so angrily guarding my few fries and player hating on other people who have more fries than I have? <laughs> so the people of Israel, what they do here in Malachi is they help us to understand why we should practice biblical giving and learn to enjoy giving God's way. One of the reasons they teach us is that you want to learn to enjoy giving is because, here we go, it creates true intimacy with God. A giving creates true intimacy with God. I call this the fruit of obedience. Now notice it says in verse 7 that God wanted his people, look at this, to return to him. Malachi was God's prophet, God's messenger to the Jews during this period. They had spent 70 years away from their homeland in captivity in Babylon. And that was because they kept getting involved in idol worship and disobeying God over and over and over and over. And God allowed them to be taken captive as punishment toward their disobedience. Now they're back in their place of worship. Now they're back at the temple. Now they're back in Jerusalem. But God says, you're still not back with me. You've not returned to me. And so the whole issue, one of the main themes of Malachi, the entire book, the whole issue of what God is trying to get them to do is return back to him. He says it in verse 7, return to me and I will return to you. And this is really baffling to the people of Israel because they're like, I mean, if you look at the end of verse 7, they're like, in what way do we need to return to you? I mean, we're, we're right here, God. We're right here. We're not in Babylon anymore. We're right here in Jerusalem. We're coming to the temple. We're making sacrifices. See, he's not talking about geography. He's not talking about location. He's talking about returning their hearts. He's talking about having a real intimacy with God. 
If I had to put it in church language, God is saying they've returned to attending church, and that's good, but they've not returned their hearts to me. Not so good. And so they say, Lord, how do we need to return to you? And the answer comes very quickly, very swiftly. God pinpoints a certain area. This isn't the only area that we have to watch in order to return our hearts to God, but giving and money is a big one. And so God says, this is one of the big ones, and I'm, gonna just, I'm just gonna hone in on it. He says, if you're really serious about returning to me and having real intimacy, you have to address this area of giving because it's the issue of the heart. More than it's an issue of numbers and money, it's an issue of the heart. And he basically begins to talk to him like he's on the street, you know, like you're having a street talk with somebody. He starts saying, you robbed me, you know. You robbed me. You ripped me. He didn't say, hey, maybe there was a miscalculation. Maybe there was an oversight this week. No, no, no. You trying to rip me off. <laughs> street talk with him. And he says, because of that, if you look at verse 9, you are under a curse. Now, you've got to be very careful. It wasn't so much that God was cursing them. But whenever we decide to go rogue, go solo, freestyle, come out from under God's plan, we go into some other plan, I've got my own financial plan, dear God, I think I can manage this by myself just fine. I understand we come out from under the covering of God. It's not so much that God chooses to quit watching over us, but we choose to come out from under God. It's like a child who runs away from home. The parent didn't do anything to cause that child danger, but that child is in more danger now because they're not under the covering and protection of their parents. God says, you put yourself in a place where now you're under a curse. You're trying to do on your own what, what you need God helped you to do. That is to manage money. You cannot manage money without me. You can't have a better plan than me. And so God says, when you say you got it, you put yourself under a curse. Okay, go on. Go on with your bad son. I'm a gentleman. I love you. I'll wait for you. That's what the prodigal son's dad did, did he? He waited for him. Let the boy get out there and squander what he had. Then the boy came back, still loved him. You know, the prodigal father is, a, is, a, is an example of God. He's a picture of God. And so this is what he's saying here. So we have to really be careful to listen to our hearts and return our hearts to God. And God says a key way in which we do that is not simply by coming to church, but it's by making sure that we are honoring him with his biblical plan for giving. In other words, he's saying you can be standing on the premises of the church and still not be in my presence. And God will still be saying, I need you to return to me. God says until we train our hearts to enjoy giving, it will take away from our intimacy with him. Jesus makes the same point over in John chapter 14 and 21. He says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, he is the one who loves me. Now notice this. He didn't just say he has the commandments, doesn't just have a Bible in his house or a Bible in his car or a Bible in his hands. You know, you have the commandments. Notice that, that last part, and keeps them. That's the person who loves me. Now, check this out. He who loves me will be loved by my father. I, too, will love him. Here's the intimacy and manifest myself to him. Do you know how we get deeper in understanding who God is? We obey what he showed us already. Sometimes we're asking God to do all this deeper stuff and show up with all this other deeper stuff, but we haven't moved on the stuff he showed us. God says he grows us from faith to faith. Yes. So God said, why should I take you into the deep bowels of these incredible miracles that you want when you haven't obeyed me in this basic stuff, like getting baptized or, or tithing and all this type of stuff? Why should I do that? So understand, he says, I will manifest myself. I will have deeper intimacy with you based on how you obey the commandments that I've given to you and you're keeping them. You're observing them. You're obeying them. So much is riding on this. See, you got to understand the people of Israel, they had been giving. They really had. They were bringing animals, but they were bringing some jacked up animals, if I can say it like that. <laughs> they really were, man. I mean, these, these, these animals they were bringing, they were sick. They were crippled. I mean, it says it right in Malachi chapter 2. They were blind. I mean, these were, they couldn't do anything else with these animals. They couldn't eat them. They couldn't use them. I mean, this was really like tree lawn stuff. This was trash. I might as well throw it away. Well, I'm not going to throw it away. I'll take it to church. And God said, come on, come on, don't do that to me. And God says, I want your whole heart. And one of the ways I know that I have your heart is how you give to me. Just like that son who didn't want to share his fries. See, when we have an attitude and we don't want to share our French fries with God, that's saying a lot. I mean, think about that, parents. How would you feel? How would I feel as a parent? You know, because you didn't bought the child everything. You, in their world, you own a cattle on a thousand hill. You could have filled up the truck with, with french fries. You didn't want, you could get your own french fries. That wasn't even the point. 
And when, when a child does something like that, in the same way God says, when my child does something like that, it's sending a message to me. First of all, it's sending, sending me the message there's an issue of gratitude in their heart. They're not grateful to me and what I have done for them. They don't understand. And then there's another issue God says in their heart. I see there's an issue of trust. They don't trust that I can re replace the one fry. That's all I wanted was one. They don't trust me enough as much as I've taken care of them. They don't trust me. They're holding on to their stuff so tight. No. <laughs> and then there's another issue of generosity. And this one I think really breaks the heart of God. Because like I said, if you really want to play where God plays and love the things that God loves and delight in the things that God delights, it has to do with generosity. God loves giving. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And the opposite of generosity, when there's tight hands over the french fries, the opposite of generosity, let me just put it to you plain, is greed. Greedy. Holding on to stuff way too tight. And this is why this moment today is such an important moment. For all of us, really. For some of us in very clear ways. And this is a time for you to not only, I believe, bring a tithe, which is wonderful, but to maybe make some lifelong decisions beyond today that this is going to be my new normal. Here's my prayer that I've been praying for all of us here at New Community throughout this week, that this today would begin, this Faith Tithe Sunday would begin something that would not stop after this Sunday. I'm praying that you would drive a stake deep in the ground that goes beyond a special day, goes beyond a pastor asking you to do it, and it becomes a day where you say, God, I have heard your voice. I will always share my fries with you because you're really the one who owns all the fries. And I want to be able to enjoy the things that you enjoy. And so, one reason we want to learn to enjoy giving is because it creates a true intimacy with God. Another reason, we can write this one down, we want to learn to enjoy giving is because it produces a special favor under God. Special favor. Somebody say favor. favor. You know, we say, hey, how you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored. How do you know? Well, you know because you look up and, man, your life is going good. When we say that we're blessed and highly favored, our life is going good. God says there's a special place of favor he gives to those who... Give according to his plan. This is what I call the fruit of faith. God says we walk by faith and not by sight. And God says he blesses us when we walk by faith and not by sight. That, that, and that's why we, we, we quote these scriptures like Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord. That's a faith statement right there. Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust, faith, with all. That means complete faith. That means holistic, comprehensive faith. That means faith not only for God to provide for me, but for me to give to God the way he's told me to give. It means faith for my family. It means faith in how I conduct myself. It means faith in, 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 in what I, how I live my life and all those things. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge the Lord. He will direct your path. See, we read that. All your ways acknowledge, okay? You follow me there? All your ways acknowledge. But see, a lot of times we, we quote these and we sing these songs not realizing the level of commitment that God is calling us to for those truths in the word to be true for us. He says, as we trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not on our own understanding, acknowledge him in all of our ways, then it's predicated on the other things we have to do. Then he will direct us. And then if you keep following Proverbs 3, you got 5, you got 6, you go down a few more verses, beyond 7 and 8, you get to verse 9. Then he begins to talk specifically about money. Honor the Lord with your wealth. That's what it says, Proverbs 3, 9. With the first fruits, see, understand, God says one of the ways we honor by giving is by giving to him first. In other words, when I become a biblical giver, I make a commitment to give to the Lord. God, I'm going to give you 10%. No matter what happens, God, I'm going to be faithful in that. And then when, when finances come in, I don't sit down and do my budget to say what all I need to pay before I give to God. No, I give to God first. It says with the first fruits of all your crops. Here's another promise predicated on honoring the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing. Then... Blessed and highly favored. Then your vats will brim over 
with new wine is predicated on me really having incredible faith and obedience to the Lord. There's just no way around it as you look at verse 10 of Malachi chapter 3 that God says there are blessings that are related to tithing. Unique blessings, exclusive blessings that are directly related to me giving at least a tenth to the work of God. I mean, you begin to look at this. He breaks it down. Look at this. Look at this. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. And there may be food in my house. Now, notice this. God gets very personal. He's using the personal pronoun my. Later, earlier in this passage, he says, uh, you, you've robbed me. See, understand, when you don't give a tithe, it's not that you're robbing a church or a man. And, and if you're a person who you're, you're a Christian, but you're not a member of a church, that's no excuse not to tithe. You can find somewhere, it may not be here, but you can find somewhere where you give to God's kingdom work. Because God says it's not about a church location or a ministry. It's something that you're taking, you're putting in my hands. Now you do it through the vehicle of earthly institutions that I use, but God says, understand, you're robbing me. I mean, that's just what God says, though, so don't shoot the messenger, okay? I love you. I, I love you all. But that's what God says. And let me tell you some other things that you need to understand about the tithe. First of all, the tithe, when we hear that word, is 10% of our earnings. That's what the tithe means. It's very clear. If you study Hebrews chapter 7, if you study many passages in the Old Testament, you see that it's established that it's for, for all practical purposes. Back during these times, if you had uh, 10 bushels of corn, then one of those would go to the Lord. If you had uh, 10 livestock, then one of those would go to the Lord. And because we use dollars and coins and currencies, 10% of those things... Uh, they go back to the Lord. The tithe goes to God's house. We're supposed to tithe off the gross and not the net. Jesus helped us with this when they asked Jesus about giving to Caesar and giving to God. You know what Jesus says? He said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. In other words, pay your taxes. And then he said, render to God what is God's. Now understand, when we pay our taxes, we pay our taxes off the gross. We don't pay it off the net. And God says, when you tithe, you tithe off the gross. The tithe is a divine standard. It's a measure that has been established by God. Some people will say, well, you know what? The tithe is in the Old Testament. It's the law. I'm not under the law. Therefore, I am not dedicated. I don't have to commit myself to tithe. Well, let me explain something to you. The tithe did not begin with the law, and the tithe did not end with the law. The tithe was given early as 400 years before the law was even established, when Abraham gave a tithe and Jacob gave a tithe. So understand, the tithe transcends the law. Jesus Christ himself, in the New Testament, as he was speaking about the tithe, he didn't condemn it. In fact, he commended it. He said, you give a tithe, that's good, you should do that. He said, but you should also do this. And by the way, if we say, hey, listen, I, I, I'm, I'm, un, I'm, I'm not under the law, that's Old Testament, then give like a New Testament giver. <laughs> what you will find out in the New Testament is that most of the examples of New Testament givers, they're giving everything. All the time they're giving more than 10%, yeah. easily. So hey, if you have a problem with that, just give like a New Testament believer. Here's the principle. When we give our lives to Christ, we literally give him everything. Yeah. We give him our next breath, we give him everything. So understand, tithing to the Lord is really just a token of me saying on a regular basis, God, you own everything. God, if you want my life today, you can have my life. And so we have to understand that. In the book of Hebrews, in chapter 7, when it talks about the order of Melchizedek, you begin to understand. I, I commend that to you to study later. I'm going to hit this and quit it and move on. But it talks about the order of Melchizedek, and just to quickly go through the theology and the doctrine there, basically, he reveals that Jesus Christ is the real priest Melchizedek. That Jesus Christ is our eternal priest. He has no beginning. He has no end. He's from everlasting to everlasting. And then when Abraham gave the tithe, it's right there in Hebrews 7, you can study it, to Melchizedek, back before Christ was actually birthed into the earth, he was literally giving it to Christ. He makes the point that all gifts that are given to the priestly order of Melchizedek are really given to Christ. And so he goes on to talk about how because of that, the, the order of, of, of Jesus Christ does not have a beginning, it does not have an end, it's not limited to history, it's not in, limited to the law, it's not in, limited to a certain people group like the Jews, it is for all time, it is God's divine standard. You say, why did God establish that standard? I don't know why God established that standard, but God has made it clear that he wants us to give sacrificially. And he says the starting point, not the end point, for us beginning to learn how to give sacrificially is to begin with the tithe. You say it becomes too legalistic if I do it, then give 11%. <laughs> I 
Don't go lower, go higher. Higher, higher, go higher. Go to 12%. If you're, if, you're, if you're messed up on the tithe, just keep giving more. Keep giving more. John Wesley, by the end of his life, he, was, he had been striving to live a reversed tithe life. You know what that is. Where he lived off 10%, he gave 90%. He got there. Because he understood that generosity and giving to the Lord really has no boundaries. And it should be an area that we're always growing in. And so here it says in verse 10, there's a special favor, there are special blessings when we tithe. And it doesn't mean that when you give $10, he's going to give you $100 back necessarily. The blessings can be spiritual. It can be for your family, your children, your health, your career. Most of the blessings that God gives us, the really good blessings, they're not really tangible. And I like that. Those are the really good ones. They're not really seen. But the bottom line is there is a special favor that God will pour out on your life as you commit yourself to give according to God's plan. He says, look at this, it will be like the windows of heaven. It will be so much that you will not have room enough to receive it. Come on, Lord. Make it so. I'm ready, Jesus. Let it happen. Yeah. And I say folks will look at you and they'll see how well your life is going, and they'll say, man, you are so lucky. But you will know the truth, that this isn't random coincidence. This is the goodness of the Lord. You are reaping from the fruit of your faith. Come on, bless him and give him glory. Look at this. Write some of these down. Here's a, here's a blessing. Here's a special favor. It says you will have prosperity. You see that? In verse 10, he says he's going to pour out a blessing so big that you won't be able to have room enough to receive it. Verse 11, write this one down, another P word, protection. He says in verse 11, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. Oh, my goodness. My wife and I have been rejoicing so much just about God's grace over our children. And we know it's God's grace because we, we're not that good of parents. But God has been so merciful. And, and with all of our feebleness and all of our weaknesses and all of our mistakes and all of our quirks, we've strived to live right before God and obey God in this area and other areas. And we've prayed many times throughout our lives, God, take whatever we are doing right and put it to the account of our children. Have mercy on our children. Bless our children. And so God says he will provide a protection that the devourer will not get your kids as you are faithful to tithe. Look at this one. He says there's a provision. You see this in verse 11? Nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field. In other words, there will not be a season where there won't be provision for you. Doesn't matter what's going on in the economy. Just because there's a recession in the economy doesn't mean you have to participate. You are a child of the Most High God. He can take care of you. Another one here, verse 12, is pleasure, for you will be a delightful land. I will give you joy in your days. Every day may not be a zippity doo dah, and I've just laughed it, laughing hilariously today, but there will be good days. God says these are the special favors he shows for those who decide to do things according to my plan. Now let me speak to somebody here because somebody may be going through something, and they say, I've done all of that, I've been tithing, I've been doing right, I've been walking right, I've been living right, I've been reading right, I've been praying right, I've been studying right, but I haven't had that special favor, Pastor KJ, I haven't had it. I, I haven't had the prosperity, I haven't had the protection, I haven't had the provision. I talked to a woman after the first service, she came up to me and she told me how her two children, 119, 123, she lost them both. One to a car accident, her daughter who was in college, the other one, where um, her son was shot, 19-year-old son was shot. And I literally ended up taking her back to my office and just ministering to her and praying with her, gave her a book and just really poured into her son and just, and so, but there may be somebody else here like that where you're saying, you know, I've been doing all of that and, 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 and the devil's making fun of me right now in my ear. He's saying, you got a lot of nerve to be here after all you've been through. Well, no, you don't have a lot of nerve, you have a lot of faith. And I just want to say, you keep on holding on. Because in the right time, God says, I'm going to bless you. He said, I'm going to give you a special favor. He said, I'm going to watch over you. You may not understand everything, but I'm going to make some things clear to you, and I'm going to bring you into another day. Those tears are going to start, turn into rejoicing in the right time. Amen. That morning is going to turn into dancing at the right time. Amen. Somebody here may have lost something that you had to give up something, and you're holding on to the Lord, and God's saying, I see your faith. I see your faith. Don't let what's going on with others throw you off that I'm not working on your behalf. God's already moving on your behalf. It's already all right. He's going to manifest it in just a moment. 
God says, I know your sorrow. I know your sacrifice. I know your pain and your labor. And God says, in the right time, I'm going to throw down something on you, and I'm going to bless you like you could never have imagined. Come on. And this is why, this is why Job is so important, because he lost everything, and yet he showed faith to hold on to the Lord. And when God saw that kind of faith by the end of Job's life, God had turned everything around. He had given him double for his trouble. It says that the Lord blessed Job in his latter days more than his former days. Oh, my. Gave him twice as many animals he had had. Gave him ten more children. So now he's got ten children in heaven, and he's got ten children on earth. Come on now. God gave him long life where he lived to see his children and his grandchildren in four generations. And when he died, he says he died full of days. That means satisfied. That means content. Is anybody ready for that? Come on. Just shake it off and say, devil, you alive. My, my fullness of days are coming. Come on. My fullness of days are coming. He was full of days. And how can you lose so much like he lost and still end up having joy? Because God says, in the right time, I'm going to work things out. God, over time, will take that pain. And he'll produce faith and he'll heal you. He'll give you double for your trouble. He'll put things in perspective and your faith will grow and you will be blessed the better because of it. Come on, put your hands together one more time and give him praise. There's one more here that we need to write down. And that is the whole issue of prominence. Don't miss this. Verse 12, he says, all nations will be blessed. You will be a blessing. See, the presence of God in your life not only brings blessings to you, but then you will be able to be a blessing to other nations, to your home, your city, to our nation. You know, we watch all this news and we watch all the stuff that's going on, and it's very troubling, isn't it? Our world more than ever needs Jesus, and I just want to challenge you that you never minimize the power of Jesus working in someone's life. I know some people think Jesus is almost like a, a poem or some nice metaphorical person or some mythology or some poetic person you interject but Jesus is alive he's real and no one can change the hearts of people and change our world more than Jesus and so you look across the landscape of our world you see how Hollywood needs Jesus you see how politicians Lord knows politicians need Jesus you see how abusive cops need Jesus and corporate greed needs Jesus you see how ISIS needs Jesus but can I say something, and I don't mean no harm, but listen, God says that when I am exalted, when my people obey me and Jesus begins to come into the situation, guess what? He can turn any situation around. Amen. You become that vehicle that helps lost people to find Jesus. All nations will call you blessed, and you will be blessed to be a blessing. You will be able to be a blessing to other nations. And that's why it's so important for us to bring God's resources into his storehouse. There is nothing more powerful than a healthy, fully operating church where God's people are bringing resources. They're turning those resources around and they're able to bless the communities. They're able to bless the members of their church. They're able to help people come to know Jesus. They're able to help children in their church and outside their church. They're able to really bring healing and all the other things that God can do for his glory in a church that's healthy church. And by the way, y'all, let me say the new community is a healthy church, amen. Can you give God some praise for that? When God's house is resourced, receiving the tithe from his people, we literally get to advance the purposes of God. Because why? We've not only returned here as a people, but we've returned our hearts to God. The very first billionaire in our world was from the United States of America. He was a millionaire by the time he was 23 years old. And by the time he turned 50, he was a billionaire. I just read an article that uh, there's someone on the brink of being the first trillionaire. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Send them to this church, Lord. And let them tithe. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. But forgive me, I digress. First billionaire. And um, three years later, after becoming a billionaire at 53, he became very ill. He was racked with pain all through his body. He lost all of his hair. He had nervousness issues. He had agony in his soul. He could only digest milk and crackers by this time. He was really, all practical purposes, a young man, but he could not sleep. He would, 
he would just have all these different problems. And so his physician finally, after really diagnosing him, said, you, you, you don't have that much longer to live. I, at the rate you're going, I think you're going to be alive one more year. And maybe it was the stress of this role of being the first billionaire. And the next year ticked off slowly, and as he was approaching death, he awoke one morning with a vague remembrance of a dream. And in essence, the dream was one of those dreams that basically said, you can't take it with you. You know, you, you just can't take it. He couldn't remember everything about it, but it really turned his heart. And he decided that he was going to take as much of his resources and begin to give them away, especially in light of the fact that he thought he was going to be dying soon. So he called his attorneys, he called his accountants, he called his managers, and he announced that he wanted to channel his assets to hospitals and research and missions work and all this type of stuff. And that's when the John D. Rockefeller Foundation was established. This new direction in which he poured all these resources in really became the key to them discovering uh, penicillin and cures for certain strains of malaria and tuberculosis and diphtheria. I mean, the list of disco discoveries go on and on and on. But the most amazing thing about John Rockefeller and what he did was that within a year, his health began to change and get better. He began to... Um, feel better, his chemistry was altering in his body and he significantly got better. In fact, he lived to be 98 years old. You will find greater joy when you give according to God's plan because it will cultivate in you an intimacy with God, which is the fruit of obedience, and special favor with God, which is the fruit of faith. Father God, we thank you, dear God, that you allow us to get in your pickup truck regularly and you you treat us you really do you give us far more than what we need there's not a person here probably who only has one pair of shoes and truthfully there are millions of people who have no pair of shoes we have exceedingly abundantly beyond what we need in fact dear God we have what we call first world problems we stress over what to wear because we have so many outfits not third world problems that stress over what to, where to find clean drinking water this day and if I have to walk two miles. We have first world problems. We stress over a plane that's canceled, a bus that runs late. You put us in your truck so often and you just, you open the windows of heaven. So God, we pray if there's a need for adjustment in our hearts, and there's a need for all adjustments in all of our hearts, including the one who's praying this, help us to loosen our fingers off the french fries. Help us, God. We get to hold this stuff so tight, we're so scared that we can't trust you. And we want to give back to you. We want to play in the sandbox that you enjoy playing in, the sandbox of generosity extravagant giving do that work in our lives heads are bowed and eyes are closed is there someone here who needs to move from returning to the church to returning your heart to God maybe there's someone here who needs to become a Christian or get saved you you, you come to church you acknowledge many things about Jesus about God you even believe that Jesus was who he said he was, the Messiah, God, he came to save. But you haven't personally given your heart, turned your heart over to him. He's calling you today. He really doesn't want your money. He wants your heart. He loves you so much. Would you give him your heart? He's calling you today. And if that's you, heads are bowed, and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And God hears you. Jesus hears you. Say this to him. Say, I come to you, Jesus, just as I am. You see me. You know who I really am. And I need you. Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you for being willing to receive me with all my flaws, all my mistakes, all my proclivities. Now say this to him, Jesus, I open my heart to you today. I invite you in. I give you my life. Say that to him. I give you my life. I declare in this moment that you are my Lord. Say this to him. And my Savior. God, what can we render to you that compares to all that you've given to us? 
It's a rhetorical question because we all know nothing. If we were to pool together all the resources, the most valuable things that humanity has that we've collected throughout human history and rendered them to you, they would still be nothing compared to how great you are. And yet you say, dear God, you like to receive French fries from us like a little child giving to their dad because it brings you so much joy. And so we render ourselves to you. We bless you. We give you glory. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Can we say together, amen? amen. Let's put our hands together in celebration.